But I have a question before you respond. So you said children don't owe adults anything because they asked to be here. Um, I just want to say, is that is that actually how you feel? Like you agree with that statement? Yeah. Okay. So how do you feel about student loans? Because the loan didn't ask to exist, right? You took the loan out. So are you going to, are you going to take, I don't stand (laughs) above me. (laughs) So are you going to take, you going to take forgiveness or are you going to own up and pay the loan? Because loans didn't ask to be here. You went out and sought them. You created the loans. Because I was told that I needed. So I'm just saying. My parents. I'm just saying. My father used to specifically say. I'm just saying. Say, bring me my degree. It wasn't their degree. It was. I'm just saying. I would be curious to know. People who say kids don't owe you nothing because I has to be here. Well, neither did them loans. So I bet not see you petitioning for ten or twenty G's off. Oh, I'm a petition all day. Yeah, interesting. All day, every day. Yeah. Uh, bunch I of will, you're a bunch of hypocrites. I think. Hi, hello, hey, and welcome to Rushed Vibes. That's it. That's the new intro. Welcome. I feel like this intro gets less and less inclus- get- inclusive as as we go along. Who all do I need to include? You and me. You need to tell people I who we are. We're talking for the next hour. Yeah, but if somebody stumbles upon an episode of Rush Vibes for the first time via an algorithm, they don't know you and me for the two people on the street. If you got to let them know. If they stumble on this episode, they're going to keep going as you look like a character from Super Mario Brothers. I'm in character. That's inspired, David. Inspired by uh, Minecraft. Make sure to just insert just David and Jess. Yeah, whatever. I also just woke up. Whose fault is that? Is that mine or yours? Tiredness. Tiredness. I told you you could go to bed. We can't keep missing recording. <sighs> huh. Like it's the holidays. We got kids. People understand. Do they? I don't know. It's not my problem though. It's not. So we're here. We're back. We're stateside. It's been two weeks since our last episode dropped. Two weeks, really? Mm-hmm. We didn't record last week or this week, technically. Okay. On schedule. So, we're back. A lot has happened. Are we recapping our lives? Or are we just jumping right into it and seeing? You mean recapping the fantastic 35th birthday celebration slash trip you and I took? Mm-hmm. To St. Lucia mm-hmm. We can recap it Okay So Why not We As everybody knows OND Which is October, November, December For those of us who work in The beverage world um, Last quarter of the year Very, very busy It's just Birthdays and holidays Just days Special days Whole whole quarter So Sonoma October 28th, Solace is November 13th, and David is November 17th. So it's a lot of fun for me to coordinate celebrating all of these people, plus Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, all that fun stuff. So in true David fashion, beginning of the year, he said he wanted to wake up on a beach for his 35th birthday. What do you mean in true David fashion? Because you're the only person in February who's thinking about your birthday in November. That's not true. It is true. <clears throat> it's not true. Number I was one. like, my birthday is next month and I haven't even asked of anything. Number one, it's not like I always do stuff like that. No, number every two, year at the beginning of the year, you'd be like, oh, you know what you can get me? I know. And I'm like, David, it's January. Why are we thinking about your November birthday? <laughs> These are falsehoods. These are absolutely true. It's not true. But anyways, it's 35th birthday. So that's okay. why I was... 
I was letting not, you know. I'm just letting you know. I'm letting the people know that you made this request in February and your birthday is in Absolutely, November. Absolutely, because it was chapter 35. So. It's important. Because I'm over the top, I obliged. And instead of taking his butt to Myrtle. <laughs> yeah, you took me to Myrtle. <laughs> yeah, I'm just letting you know right now, if we went to Myrtle Beach for my birthday, we wouldn't have made it back. We'd have been one of those, uh, one of those new specials where they reenact like some horrific crime scene or crime murder mystery, they wouldn't have found your body. You'd have been just fine. Yeah, I'd have been great. They wouldn't have found you. I'd have been just fine. Uh, So we did it up and I spent essentially a year prepping and planning this trip. 10 months. A year. Uh, Final hour, selected the location. We went to St. Lucia. After a weekend of having two birthday parties, Saturday we had a birthday party for Sonoma, which rolled into a slumber party birthday party for Solace. Monday, Tuesday, we worked and packed and got people to their respective places. Wednesday morning, we were at the airport very early preparing to get to St. Lucia. We got to St. Lucia and we St. lucia Um It's a beautiful island and I chose it because... It seems like not a lot of people know about St. Lucia. Uh, I don't. I knew about St. Lucia. I don't know the context, but I've like heard of it. I don't know that I've ever met a St. Lucian before, um, but I'm familiar in terms of like Caribbean of St. Lucia. So, but it's not a very popular. It's not like a Barbados, Bahamas, places where you know people typically go. It's definitely a high tourist country, but at least in our circles, I don't know a lot of people who go to St. Lucia. So I kind of wanted that for, for David to have a special, not oversaturated, like every time he's, Oh, when I went there and it's just like, I just wanted him to have his birthday. Um, but now we can be the people that when you go to St. Lucia and tell us when we went there, we can, we can tell you that, but, um, got to St. Lucia only really had one hiccup upon arrival. Uh, and that was just our transportation, initial transportation oh, yeah. the helicopter. from the airport to the resort. But honestly, it worked out the way it should have. Because um, I feel like taking the helicopter back, we kind of knew what to look for in terms of, because we had already driven through. So we kind of had an idea, at least uh-huh. I had an idea of like places I wanted to see from above. Um, but it's a beautiful island. Uh, the people are pretty nice. Food was really good. I've been to the Dominican Republic twice and Mexico twice. And I will say I never truly enjoy the resort food at any of those places. Uh, The food that we and I don't usually like buffets at resorts. The food in St. Lucia was good. I didn't have to besides the breakfast that we got delivered that I think I put pepper on my eggs. um, I didn't season any of their, you know, traditional meals everything was flavorful delicious i think i had oxtail at least twice um food was great uh weather was was great too no humidity um and we really explored like we we had some downtime the first day and a half of the trip and then we you know we got into saint lucia we david wanted to horseback ride we went horseback riding never again I wanted to go ATV. Never again. It was David's trip. It was he a horrible decision. Wanted to horseback ride, so we. I dropped the ball on that one. It's okay. It was never, your, it never was again. It's your never again. Trip. Um, those horses just honestly didn't look like they were built to carry people. <laughs> they were they were very slender horses, um, but I think the animals in Saint Lucia are just slender animals. Horses wouldn't wouldn't have been an issue. It was just the saddles were like. They were very, very hard. They were Wish.com saddles. Uh, they were not They were not Amazon purchased saddles. My ass is still sore. No, it's not. No, it is. No, it's not. No, it is. You're lying. No. It, I mean, one, it's my ass, so you wouldn't know. Number two, yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So we horseback rode. Uh, we had a birthday dinner on the beach. We did a couple's massage. At night. At night. Nice. Listening to the waves. Served right on the beach. Um, couples massage. And then we did uh, another big excursion. We rode a catamaran and we essentially did an island tour from the water. We went to the Sulphur Springs. 
We did mud baths. We got into these really hot springs. Um, it felt great. It did. I actually wish we had a hot spring. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was really nice to dip into and just Cause as your body adjusts. Because it's really hot. And then you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. But the initial like toe touch, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is really hot. I can't get in there. But then when you force your body to get in, you're like, oh, this feels really good. And my joints are relaxing. So we did that. We had a traditional meal off of the, part of the excursion. And then we had a boat party on the way back to our resort. We had a boat party? We had a boat party. <laughs> no, nah, you had a boat party. And don't, for one second, think I'm not going to run the clip on this episode, okay? So I, just want you, I, I just want you to be prepared that the clip's going to run. And people are going to see you Yo, they, swag surfing they had on rum, a catamaran. They had rum punch and patone which is the national beer of St. Lucia. And I partook in both. So there are just certain songs. If I'm around and you play it, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to participate in the associated dance. They played swag surfing. I swagged and I surfed. And you all will get to see it when I run the clip. I hope he forgets. I won't Um, forget. And then we were supposed to come back on Sunday. We were. Got to the airport. Everything is seamless. Get on the plane. Plane starts to taxi. Plane stops. Computer on the plane wasn't working. So they tried rebooting refreshing restarting uh every re you can think of they took us back to the gate had somebody tinker around with it uh over the course of three hours of us sitting on the plane they realized that either they weren't going to be able to fix it i did hear that there was a rumor that they fixed it but the crew ran out of time they had like but i was like there was only one flight no, I guess they flew in from Charlotte. So their shift was over. So they weren't able to, that was part, that was what I overheard someone saying that they technically fixed it the night before, but the crew didn't have any more um, work time. So we had to, we were scrambled. Uh, American Airlines fortunately put us in a hotel, what seemed to be a geriatric hotel. <laughs> um and gave us little tea sandwiches when they said they were preparing plates for us to eat. Uh, we slept, woke up, had to get back in a taxi and drive an hour and 20 minutes back to the airport to do it all over again. Uh, so instead of coming back on Sunday, we came back on Monday. So we had an additional extra day in uh, St. Lucia. But I feel that since we were technically on a plane and then got off a plane, that we technically just had two trips to St. Lucia. And we stayed at a different resort. Okay. So we had our second trip to St. Lucia was short winded, but we had two trips. Uh, and it was one of those situations where you're like, I, I can't make this up. And it, I, I was very bothered because I had a moment where I was like, Oh, this is our first like incident free trip. no, so I think every trip we've been on, something has happened. Detroit, we well, we made it in Detroit, but we just came home to a snowstorm. Um, Vegas, we got in a car accident. Something happened. Dominican Republic, we had a delay coming back from Miami. And then St. Lucia, we had an extra day in St. Lucia. So uh, either way, it was a phenomenal trip. I had a few people reach out. Uh, and asked me like the rundown on St. Lucia and Instagram. And I was just like, this is more than Instagram. And we probably just have to do a secondary episode and really just break down St. Lucia um, and our trip and maybe insert pictures. It can be like our vlogish type of episode. Uh, but it's a beautiful island. Highly encourage you to go. If you're in the Charlotte area, you can get a direct flight from American. Um, and I feel like that takes half the headache out of traveling when you don't have to worry about connecting and the fact that you can get to the Caribbean on a direct flight that deep into the Caribbean. Um, it's really cool. So see the world. Don't, 
don't waste don't just be stuck just go somewhere you're an american get get your passport and make sure it's that's something i was always raised on to just always have your passport american passport is a powerful document so have it and use it so don't be going to atlanta and miami there are other places so that's my my quick summation of St. Lucia. I don't know if David has anything he wants to add. Oh, I will say before he officially adds. So as y'all know, um, an Aperol Spritz is my defaulted vacation drink. I'm not on vacation if I don't have an Aperol Spritz. We managed, unless St. Lucia as an island does not carry Aperol, we were at a resort that did not have Aperol. They had Campari, same parent company. Campari is the parent company, but Campari is also its own bitters. Um, Campari was everywhere. Campari signs were everywhere. Campari advertisements everywhere. There was no Aperol. Like Aperol is a step down in bitterness. Like it's like kind of, it's not overly bitter. Whereas Campari in a Negroni is super bitter. Um, so I didn't have an Aperol spritz. Um, there was a different type of bitters. And I was able to get the bartender to make shift a drink for me and it sufficed but I was very very hurt that I was not able to have my traditional Aperol spritz and then I couldn't get my I could only get my French 75 at one bar because only one bartender knew what it was off the top without me having to explain so there was that too so it was like my backup drink I wasn't able to get either so that's it your turn so this is a uh, Aperol spritz that I made for myself my turn, huh? 15, 15 minutes in. No, it was a lovely recap. It was actually perfect. You're not going to add anything? Would you like me to add? Something. You don't have anything to add? I covered everything. It was a great trip. I mean, it was your birthday. It was a fantastic trip. Okay. It was everything I, uh, I had hoped it would be. And actually a little bit more. It was, the weather was beautiful. It wasn't an overcrowded resort. People were nice. Staff was nice. The sights were great. It was mountainous. I, I really, it was, it was like paradise, to be honest. I got, had a swim out pool in the room. At the room, I had a sw- little, little swim out. It was, uh, it was perfect. Had the, uh, we had a butler because of because of status. That was WhatsApp and Jessica. Felt like, felt like royalty at the Royalton. So the only thing I didn't like is somebody's always trying to sell you something. Mm-hmm. Like down the beach, like brother man. How long you been here? Yeah, I'm like, oh, man, I don't, I don't want nothing from you. Mm-hmm. I'm not your brother, man. I'm just and black. Everybody wanted to sell David weed. I'm just black. Everybody. He got several nicknames. <laughs> that's why. I, that's why I got my Bob Marley shirt on. Yeah, Rastaman being one yeah, of call them. Call me Rastaman. So I'm gonna change hey. his contact in my phone to Rastaman. Hey, 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 Rastaman. I'm like, nah, man. I don't do that. I'm pure. That I'm do that reefer stuff. Um, the face was because he said he's pure because he's not. I am pure. Uh, it's, but yeah, everybody was trying to trying to say something. So, and I hate saying no, uh, especially one to people who are just trying to make a buck, uh, and two, you know, people of melon uh, complexion. But they are. They were just relentless. Mm-hmm. You did buy something that, which I wasn't expecting us to, and I was like, "I'm I'm the keeper of the money." So he was like, "Yeah, I'll get one." What your bracelet? Oh yeah, well it was pretty cool. And then I had to end and up then getting the dude, an anklet. And the dude took pictures of us. He did. So like a lot of pictures. Um, but yeah, so uh, I, I did buy my one. But once I bought my one thing, that was it. We didn't buy anything else mm-hmm. from uh, from anybody. I was like, now Royal and got my money. Yeah, a lot of it. All, all my, all my G's, all my bands. So you want someone to go talk to the resort? Yeah, see was, if they give you some. 
It was quite the trip. Um, I will say that. Uh, nice. It was our first trip. I, I, I won't count Ghana, but it's my first trip to a black Caribbean island. Um, and I enjoyed it. I I enjoyed St. Lucia. I would definitely go again. I got to say, I wasn't too thrilled about them not them basically not having any speed limits on the island. They did have speed limits. They did. People in just certain, didn't oblige. No, in, in certain spots they had speed limits. And there you could go like 10 miles and not see a speed limit sign. You were monitoring the speed limit signs? Yes, I was monitoring my life. Because there are times if, where I thought it was in peril. If you get car sick, if you are just vehicularly sensitive, uh, don't go to St. Lucia. Like as Oops. we were driving, and maybe because I've, I feel like I've driven in enough I've been driven in enough foreign countries that I just understand that the style of driving is very different from what we're used to. So in my head, I had a Rolodex of people who I would not travel with to St. Lucia because of the means of transportation, because I know they could not handle being in a car with the St. Lucian driver. They were passing people for like no reason. They were going slow. That was their reason. My bro, you don't need to pass the school bus. There were no school bus. <laughs> you don't need to pass the school, school bus. Right? You don't need to- <laughs> The kids just trying to get to school, man. You don't need to pass them. Just slow down. I'm trying to trying to zoom past a bus on an incline, Jessica. I mean, and the island, going up a mountain. The island is a mountain, so you're either going up or you're going down. There are very few like, straightaways, bro. lots of curves. Like I don't know. I, the, I almost our initial trip was going to be to St. Martin, and I was going to rent a car because people said it's a very maneuverable island. Um, everyone said, "Do not drive in St. Lucia." Like caps lock do not drive in St. Lucia. And I understand why it's one is my first time in an opposite. And they drive right on side. the left side of the road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, driver's side is on the right side. Um, which was funny. Cause when we were leaving the airport, I went to go sit on the left side of the car and Neptune, our driver was trying to tell me to go to the other side while David was opening the door for me. And once I sat down, I understood why he was telling me to go to the other side because I'm shorter. So I would have been behind the driver and David, who's taller, would have been on the passenger side. But I didn't realize that St. Lucia was an opposite side of the road and car country. But yeah, that adds to the anxiety of driving because you're you feel like you're on the wrong side of the road. So you see cars approaching and you're just like, we're going to get hit and we're not. We're just not in America. So that was um, that was trippy. I won't lie. That was very trippy. Um, But yeah, I I was going through a Rolodex and I was like, I would not come to St. Lucia with these people, this person, this person, this person, like all the people who have ever like implied they wanted to travel with me i was like nah because just the drive the hour and a half drive from the airport to the resort <clears throat> and that, that's the thing and that was what was so frustrating about the flight being canceled coming home mm-hmm. is that there's no resort on the side of the island where the airport is so you got at least an hour yeah. 20 minute drive it's already like late and then by the time we got back to our room a couple of people i mean if we had been more motivated if i had been more motivated we probably could have gotten to a a buffet on the <clears throat> at the secondary resort that mm-hmm. they sent us to but i was tired so i laid down and i was like well they're sending food up to the room and i realized they were going to send um hard tack and, and water they said so, to, so it's a former english i mean it's a both french and english colony it's been both the we got a very good history lesson. On yeah, Saint I mean, Lucia. they didn't really send us heart attack and water. It was, it was. They sent us tea sandwiches, just was, as I described. There's English tea sandwiches. So they were, it was just bread, and one had tomatoes some, some lettuce. and cucumber, maybe a little, a little bit of lettuce, and it might have been lettuce or spinach, and it was just it was cut like, in half. It was like that much. Lettuce. And then they they presented it, and then they gave us one with, it was a it was mayonnaise, a slice of ham, a slice of cheese, the other piece of bread, and cut on a on a the bias the the triangle and four pieces of fruit four pieces of pineapple four pieces of watermelon and two sodas i I never felt more disrespected and when we got there they were like oh we have plates being prepared for you so i was like oh that's sweet but then i was like well what are what's on these plates like you don't know my dietary restrictions how hungry i am i have been in an airport for three hours so shorty's gonna knock on the door right she knocked on the door and she was like, 
room service or whatever she said. And then she was standing there with the, with the tray. And so I saw it, but I didn't know if she had like somebody behind her with like another tray because I was like, there's no way that they expect this two adults this serving to to feed two adults so i'm like looking behind her and she's like looking at me trying to figure out what i'm looking for and i'm like no i'm not looking at you i'm trying to see where your co-worker is who has the secondary tray because i know this isn't what y'all what y'all promised us this is what i was in this can't be what i was looking forward to and then you know she had the audacity to say i'm gonna need my tray back she did so I'm like, what's your dusty she's tray? She's gonna go give sandwiches. <laughs> there were 17 rooms that they had available in that that hotel that we got, um, but the room didn't even have a TV. I was like, there's no TV, which wasn't surprisingly was an issue for me because we don't have a TV in our bedroom. That's so it's true, but I think because I was in hotel mode and we had just left a hotel, a resort that had a TV. Um, I expected one, but it really wasn't a big deal. It was, we are here long enough to sleep. They said they were going to call us and let us know what time the cabs were coming. I had to call down and they were like, oh yeah, eight o'clock. Mind you, I woke up at seven twenty. Yeah. Um, by the time we got there, they were like, which was your taxi driver? And our taxi dude was actually loading up the van, getting ready to leave. And we were like, oh, that's him right there. They're like, oh, you better go catch him. And it was crazy. Is that the shorty? Is that the old lady in the in the van? The black lady was like, um, "What did she say?" Leave no man behind. Leave no man behind. They sure was getting ready to leave our asses behind. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm gonna say. Well, they might not have because we had the voucher. <laughs> they was gonna leave us, and he wouldn't have gotten paid for every passenger that he took. They were about to leave us. They were not. I don't believe Chris was gonna leave us, but yeah, whatever. Anyway, we survived. It wasn't the worst thing in the world. We got an extra day in St. Lucia uh, and then had to come back and scramble. You got an extra night in St. Lucia. We didn't get a day in St. Lucia. Because we didn't, we were, if, and I was telling, I think I was telling my boss, I said, you know, people hear, oh, you get stuck in St. Lucia, get put in a hotel. Oh, it must be fun. But no, because by the time we got off the plane, it was nightfall. Like the sun was setting. Um, by the time we got to the resort an hour and 20 minutes away, like the kitchen was closed for the most part. So and they don't have room service and they don't have room service. So it's not like, Oh, we got our flight got canceled Poverty. at noon and we got to our hotel at two and we still had like the afternoon to just kind of be in the streets, go to the beach or whatnot. No, we were just back in the room, like go to, go to bed, wake up in the morning. So it wasn't, it wasn't horrible. Like the conditions and things could have been worse, but it also wasn't great. Um, I would have preferred if it had happened earlier in the day that we could have had the opportunity to even go to a restaurant, like just not have been. And I guess what sucked is that we had to take a 10 minute helicopter ride to get to the airport, which was phenomenal only to then still have to do an hour plus commute back and forth. So, um, that was that, but St. Lucia definitely has a piece of my heart. It's a beautiful Island, really nice people. I would, I would definitely go back and encourage other people to go visit. All right. So now that we've St. Lucia, we've got to dive in. So this is mainly your topics board. So you get 20 or 27 minutes. So I don't think we're going to get through all of them. Okay. We can, we can always, we always have other episodes we can do. Um, I mean, you know, obviously while we uh, have been, I guess off from the uh, from the podcast, some some things have have happened uh, to uh, mass to notable mass shootings. Uh, one on the campus of University of Virginia involving football players coming back from school. I think it was a theater performance, really, like a like a I don't know, field called, trip. called a field trip in, in college. But I guess is what it was, it was a field trip. And then one here a couple of days ago, um, a Walmart in Virginia, Roanoke, mm, and Chesapeake. Chesapeake, excuse me, um, where a uh, manager uh, waited for employees to come into a break room and then started shooting, killed six, I believe, six people. So um, 
you know, we're a little late on the news cycle as it pertains to these things. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's, um, um, <laughs> I, I don't really know why, why I suggested we talk about them, I guess, cause they're so such popular topics that we should mention it. But I mean, I don't, I don't know what's, what's going to be said that hasn't already been said a million times before, because this is stuff that keeps happening. Mm -hmm. Um, here in this country and no one ever really does anything so it's just like thoughts and prayers it's just like all right we just you know, we mourn we grieve we wait we contribute to to gofundmes and then you know we just kind of wait for the next one to happen so <clears throat> you know uh it it <clears throat> I'm sorry, and I, I forgot the Colorado Spring one. Goodness gracious, for, forgive me. Um, I forget, just messing up count because there's so many. Um, where uh, Gummin walked into a, uh, a um, kind of like what kind of nightclub was it? Sorry, it was. It was a. I think it's referred to as a gay nightclub. Gay, a gay nightclub. Excuse me. <clears throat> And just shot, just started shooting. Um, but was uh, subdued mm -hmm. by patrons, which was nice to see. Um, I'm only disappointed because I didn't kill him. Mm -hmm. But you know, they were they roughed him up, so I guess that's you know, some solace. But yeah, it's just uh, it's a terrible thing to see one that you have to think about if you're going out somewhere to a place where there's going to be a lot of people, uh, if you're going to be out in the open, like, you know, could the shooting happen here? Mm -hmm. Could someone just, someone be having a bad day? Could someone here have said something to someone two, three years ago, could there be a former employee here who has, you know, an ax to grind? Like, I don't know about you, but I, I very frequently think when we go out, especially with the kids, like, could something happen mm -hmm. here? Uh, and it's, it's a sucky way to live. And most people would say, Oh, you just got to live your life. You never know what's going to happen. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, but I mean, kids coming home from a field trip, um, LGBTQ plus people trying to trying to enjoy, you know, uh, have a have have a celebrate just have a good time mm -hmm. with their own people in their own space in their own space. Um, people are trying to work underpaid, <laughs> more than likely underpaid, just clocking into work or having a break from work. And now we got it's just I don't know. yeah, it's definitely is. Unfortunate. And I know a lot of people in other countries question, like, America's safety. Like, we, I feel like Americans hold themselves on this pedestal, but, like, people around the world hear about these mass shootings, and they're just like, wow, America's a very dangerous place. They still want to come here, but that's, that's seen as part of normal life from the outsider's perspective. And it absolutely is, unfortunately. I remember there was one time we were pulling up to Solace's school. I think I had, I was taking, no, it was um, curriculum night or the night before school starts where you get to go meet the teacher and everything. And I remember it bothering me that her classroom is like the first one as you approach the building. And it was dual sided because there was a part of me that's like, I can't believe that I have to be, that's a thought that has to cross my mind that my kid is in immediate danger. If someone is to come and attack this school because her classroom is the first one by the front door. And what a morbid thing to have to think like I should be able to just send my kid to school and you know, the worst thing should be, she might scrape her knee sliding, coming down the slide too fast in her uniform skirt but my thought was I really don't like that her classroom is right here 
that if someone decides to stand outside the building and start spewing bullets, like that's the classroom that will get hit. It's a morbid, unfortunate way of thinking, but you're absolutely right. When the, I think the breaking of the Walmart shooting, I had just sent you to Walmart to pick up groceries. It it happened that night, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Later that night. So not trying to be one of those people who's like, Oh my gosh, this could have happened to me. But in another city, I know. I'm going to tell you right now, if my ass had gotten clipped because you sent me I to Walmart, go. you told me. You, because you, you sent me to, no, let me finish. If I gotten clipped because you wanted to wait till the night before Thanksgiving to, to go, before, two nights before Thanksgiving to go and get your, uh, to get the stuff you needed. Ooh, girl, I'd have been waiting on you. Well, that's because. I would have been waiting let, on you in heaven. Let us address why. No. Two nights before I'd Thanksgiving. Have been, I'd have been posted up. Heaven, right next to Paul. Heaven's not the place for grudges. I'd have been posted up. Do we want to address why two nights before <laughs> like, Thanksgiving yo, you had to I pick like up Paul, groceries? Paul, I got this one. Do we want to address? I got why, this one. Do we want to address why two nights before Thanksgiving I was <clears throat> picking up groceries? No. Okay. They ain't got nothing to do with me. And we can address the fact that I was going to get them. But you low-key didn't want to be home alone with the kids. I, it has nothing to do with me wanting to be home alone with the kids. I just figured I would go get the groceries because I knew it was going to be a wait. It was a, I mean, it was a pickup order, so he wasn't in the store. She just had to, she just had to deliver. They didn't have any delivery slots because, again, it was the week of Thanksgiving, and I was ordering groceries last minute because yes, you were. our initial plans had been what's Anyways. the word interrupted. Anyways, um, so yeah, so you know, that's something that crossed my mind. Chesapeake could be Charlotte, could be Chicago, could be you know Chattanooga. I don't know why I'm saying CH cities, but. Um, anywhere like I remember as a kid not taking it seriously like when my mom would always before we leave the house no pray pray you know and thank God for traveling mercies and blah 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 but I mean it literally anytime you leave your house whether you go into some uh, an establishment or not like being able to come home that is a big blessing that's a big thing because things happen on the road things happen in stores Things happen in schools. So a helicopter come down on seventy seven the other day. So I mean, there's like life is just not safe. So <laughs> I'd say I mean, that, but it's not unsafe vibes. I mean, like yeah, it's just I mean, not. So being able to leave and come home is definitely something that I think we take for granted. But it's just it's a sad world. It is a in in times in places. So. I think that's all I really want to to do. We just got we got a lot of fragile men mm-hmm. um, out there um, who don't clearly have issues uh, processing and dealing with um, their 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 feelings, their mental health. They don't know how to handle, um, they don't have what do you call the emotional intelligence. Uh, it's just, there's just a lot of fragile men out there. And as, and as you always see, it's some dude, mental health issues, whatever, emotional issues, um, carrying these acts out. And it's, um, I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's just sad. And, uh, I don't know what, I, I don't know what it accomplishes. Like, and I don't know, cause I've never, maybe just because I've never been in a state of mind where I'm ready and willing to take lives from innocent people, take the lives of innocent people. What do you kind of like? I think it's a power complex. I think it's a uh, the the little I have heard in terms of updates from the Chesapeake shooting. He did leave a note, and you know he was he was seen as a loner. He was made fun of. I think they said um, I was listening to a piece on NPR on the drive home, and they said that you know people referenced him to Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, and I guess the triggering point was someone hacked his phone and I don't know if it was a work 
a coworker and they released whatever they found on his phone, but I guess his privacy had essentially been um, violated. But, you know, he he was to himself and he was different. And I think you have a lot of people who are dealing with stuff and you don't have a lot of resources or you don't get resources until the bad things happen. Like that's when grief counselors are available and all of this stuff. To your point, you have people who are overworked and underpaid, um, who probably don't have benefits, who you know don't have access to therapy, or even if they do, do they have the time for it? Is that something that's really emphasized? You know, the structure of our society is is very much so work, work, work. Um, you need to work to survive. But you know, yes, we are making efforts in terms of acknowledging the importance of mental health. But I don't know if we're doing enough because we keep having these issues come up. And I mean, you've got shootings based off of hate shootings based off of just, I have the ability to do it and you've, you know, tormented me, you've harassed me. Uh, so this is how all, these are all tragic regardless, but I think some could have been avoided. You know, I think sometimes yeah, it's easy to make fun of someone to to crack jokes, but not everyone has the capacity to handle being the butt of a joke. And sometimes, you know, people are mean. And again, not justifying someone going to work. I was going to say, because it sounds like you, no, you're no, no, no. making... I'm just saying, you know, sometimes <laughs> making. you need to, like, a lot of people don't know when to apply restraints when it comes to poking fun at somebody. Um, people are, some people are just, you know, they just choose to be to themselves. Let, let them be, you know, he comes to work, he does his job, you know, be nice to him. I know that there was someone in the note that he spared. I did see an interview. There was a lady, I think her name might've been Jessica. Um, she said she had just started. Um, she said he, he pointed the gun at her and, and said something along the lines of, you know, like get out of here or go home. Um, but like specifically spared her. Maybe she was nice to him. Maybe, you know, I don't know, but I think it's... You know who was picked on? You? Yeah. I mean, I was picked on too. You know who got all the skinny jokes when they were growing up? We all got something. You know, you know who was... You know who had this? Somebody started a rumor around school that I was gay back when, like, in the late, late 90s when being gay was like, oh, me. So I don't, I mean, I, I, I get it, right? Because it's not, because it didn't feel good to be picked on and it doesn't feel good to be picked on. Um, and it's not a fun, you're, it's not fun being the subject of, mm -hmm. of, of that. But I'm saying clearly you weren't fragile. Like you don't know, maybe he grew up getting picked on and then he I mean, was also picked on at home too. How do you know I wasn't fragile? I mean, you haven't shot nobody. Yeah, but I mean, that doesn't mean it didn't, it Again, didn't hurt not, a lot. I feel like you're taking this as saying, no, I'm, I'm just, justifying. I, I I'm don't, just saying you never know. I'm telling people not to do these things because well, you never know how much someone can take before they are going to snap. So yeah, like, I mean, bullying but in I, general should not be a thing that we do no i absolutely agree but i feel like that should be that's understood can you take those glasses off <laughs> what's wrong with the glasses this is always oh, a serious conversation you can't take me seriously is that it no so you're not gonna talk about that okay I'm i'll just take, not gonna look i'll at take you. the glasses i'm off. just this is better now the light is it feels it feels weird they're not even tinted There's no but no it, it, it blocked a little bit of light because they're it anyway, I don't. I, I honestly don't want to give any more unless you still want to go on. I mean, I. I'm just adjusting to that. I, I grew up with the last name Asthma, so I got made fun of a lot. I mean, yeah, you had immigrant parents, and y'all was, you know, African. Like I'm sure y'all got picked on. Yeah, it's called African booty scratcher. Oh yeah, I remember that one. And then I, I had like a chubby period. He was a little chunky. I was a little chunky. Yeah. I got made fun of for that. Then I lost a whole bunch of weight, and then I got made fun of for that. So I mean, you're all, you're right. You're always going to, and then to just be African and come from a people who like just like making fun of people. Like Africans are bad. So it's like, 
you can't justify it, but I'm just, I just feel like, especially those people who you can tell, just, just leave people, just leave them alone. But you know, there's some people you can't tell. I don't know. Um, I'm not, I'm not a specialist in this. I don't know how, if any way this could have been avoided, uh, if it was the person who hacked his phone and triggered him or whatnot, but, um, just people are going through stuff. And unfortunately, they just don't know how to manage and don't have the resources to be helped. So, <sighs> Lasai. Um, did you intentionally do the heavy topic first so that we can just... Oh, I just looked at the one that was kind of like center mass and, okay. and started talking. But so... Um, I mean, I, I don't, I, that may not be the heaviest one, but who knows? All right, what's next? We have the board is back. That you can't see. But I'm gonna keep showing the board. Um it's right there. I don't know why you put the, the last one on there. Like <laughs> this is this is surprising I, to anybody. It, 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 I, I just feel like there's a lot that can still be unpacked. It's not like Can you just pick a topic instead of us talking about the topics? Uh let's I uh, well I mean we're at forty four minutes already. Um Like, this is so tough. I just, it's, easy, it's better when the conversation just flows naturally instead yeah, of like we were on such a heavy talk, topic. What do you want to talk about now? It's just, it's just a hard transition to make. We were on a very heavy topic, and I just didn't want to keep harping on it, and I didn't want to seem like I was giving. All right, advice. let's talk about something fun. Um, how about the teachers fired <laughs> for having uh, OnlyFans scenes shot at the school? So this actually came out a few months ago. Because I remember seeing it. Oh, really? And yeah. it's just, why, why is it resurfaced? I don't know. I yeah. guess there just wasn't. They might, maybe they finally went to trial or something. Yeah. Initially, I only knew about the teachers being fired for having an OnlyFans. And I didn't think that was a big deal. I was like, okay, teachers have an OnlyFans. Teachers need side incomes as well. Like, I work in the promo gig industry. I knew a lot of teachers who would do promotions on the side. So I was like, okay, you got a successful, lucrative OnlyFans. You know, go on with your bad sales. Then I found out about it taking place, I think at the middle school. And I can't remember if it was students who realized it was at the school or like a fellow parent or a parent or if it was an associate, like a fellow associate. Either way, someone else is on OnlyFans watching. And what's crazy is that she blocked everyone from the state. Was it Arizona, I think, or whatever state oh, she lives in? Do that. She blocked any account from the state she lives in from viewing and she used an alias but i heard she shared it on her personal facebook i don't know but either way somebody found that joint out and of course i mean she's in middle school teenage boys it don't take much um but if she blocked this anyone from the state from viewing her page Maybe a former classmate, a former, uh, I mean, a former student, a former student's father. Like, and I guess I wonder, I really wish I remember who it was who found it because I remember hearing it and questioning, like, why were you on OnlyFans? Well, I think. And then how did you, I, it might've been a parent because I feel like I thought, well, did you go to your wife and say, hey, honey, I was on OnlyFans and found the kid's old teacher or something like that? So I think one we need to have a this is a small part of a bigger conversation right can teachers um, have fans <laughs> well, all right so maybe a smaller part of two bigger conversations <laughs> the one i was leaning toward was the uh sex work and how people perceive platforms that uh encourage it uh, and those who uh partake in the profession, how they're perceived by people who aren't in the business. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I mean, you just kind of see it like, Oh, dude, she got only fans. Oh, watch out. Uh, even you see it on Twitter and stuff. And I'm not going to act like, I'm not going to say to not act like I haven't been judgmental of people who have, you know, um, do the homemade videos or mm -hmm. who, who have, uh, starred in porn flicks and things like yeah, that. I mean, let me take all my content down. 
Um. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just is joking, by the way. But um. But sex work is I mean, just work. It's the oldest profession, right? So it's up there with farmers. When you when you never thought of it that way. When you think about like inflation, um, how wages have remained incredibly stagnant over a long period of time. Everything is getting more expensive. Um, but you know, like I said, wages aren't moving in the same direction. You know, people got to want to get creative. Uh, and then people also have to supplement their main income because mm-hmm. it's not, it's not enough. And I don't think, you know, we should, I don't think you should like, we should get to look down to somebody who has an only fans where they either pose nude or they actually, you know, um, are, are doing sexual acts because it's just, I mean, it's just work. And it's that person has full autonomy of, over their body, uh, assuming they're of, you know, legal age to, to be doing stuff like that. And, you know, far be it for me to sit here and clown some, try to clown or, or think somebody is beneath me who's out there working, getting money, taking care of themselves just because it's, it's something that I wouldn't do, you know? Um, I just think it's time for us to reevaluate how we um, look at, perceive, um, and respect uh, sex workers. Mm-hmm. I just that's just me personally, and you know I, I don't have an issue with the teacher because this isn't the first story of this kind to come out, especially like since the pandemic. Um, we've heard of a special um, what do they call them? First responders having OnlyFans and then you know getting fired or whatever. So I think this particular one, she got fired because it she took place on the <laughs> she was not smart. But um, if it weren't for that, you know, hopefully it wouldn't have been an issue for anybody. Yeah, I mean, I applaud the creativity attempt. Um, I'm still like raising an eyebrow to the person who found it and then reported it. Uh, but see, you, that's because you're. No, I'm just yeah, saying because I feel like it was a whole stick. You I like, that whole no, no, no. I said I'm raising it to the person who found it and reported it. Um, so, I mean, if people, I mean, I don't care if we got to reassess how we think of people of no, how sex just, workers. Why, why, why wouldn't we rethink people who watch, who consume the content? Somebody's got to consume the content, that's right? That's true. So why think, would you? Why would you feel less, judgy? I feel like there's less shame in being a, the worker. Than being the consumer. Why, why would there be shame of being a consumer? I, I just, because most of the consumers are like creepy old white guys. Why? What, what's that? Where will you get those stats? So like 74% of OnlyFans patrons of sexual content are old white men. Older white men. Where'd you get this number? I made it up. Yeah, I know you did. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's like close. You it's, might be surprised. It's close too. You might be surprised. Um, no, I'm, I'm BSing that. I just think it's, I guess it kind of rolls back to that initial conversation we had, like episode three with Jesse Williams on Broadway being naked, where... You mean the one that you didn't tell me we were going to say and talk about a dude's penis? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think my thought is, because you even said, like, that performance was a private space the people, the patrons who were watching it, it was no one's place to take that picture and put it on social media. Right. So I feel like with OnlyFans, that's supposed to be an established understanding where I've paid to view your content. That should be a private engagement. I should not then screenshot it, screen record it, mm. whatever, and then make it public to be used against you. Um, because if you're going to find this person at fault for posting or sharing footage of themselves. I also need to judge you for watching this footage. Whereas okay. if it had stayed private, I don't know this person is sharing content. I don't know you're viewing the content. So that's kind of where I see it. I have no issue. Like I thought about this and I was like, well, what if, you know, Solace's teacher had an OnlyFans and I found out, is that something that I'm going to. Is she pregnant? 
Yes, but I was <laughs> I'm just saying that would be a different kind of I mean, be, I mean that context. And there is pregnancy porn. That's I know. A thing. I, I mean I, I'm People aware fetishes. I'm I'm quite aware. Um, I know this. I got hit on a lot while pregnant. Somebody tried to somebody try to recruit you? Some dude was just like, I heard pregnant women are amazing. And I was just like, sir. Like I was at a doing a, in a convenience store doing a visit. Oh, yeah. And the owner I had to be like, dude back up interesting I, I know, i'm not hearing the story until now i never told you no i told a lot of people i'm surprised you didn't hear i'm i'm surprised myself i should have been the first person you told i'm sure i mentioned it you no just you didn't always be listening nah um i don't remember that so what was i saying um because i don't went back to the store and got them security tapes what was i saying i was trying to say that I, judgment would go both ways if solace is teacher i don't feel that what a lot of people do by night should affect what they do by day. I think a person can be a great teacher, nurturing, provide great education for students, and still, one, get paid crap after spending a day with your badass kids. Um, and y'all's, to, y'all's badass yeah, kids. Our kid is, um, she's gets great reviews on her behavior. Y'all's badass kids. Um, and then, you know, not get paid enough and still have to supplement and pay bills and still, you know, trying to pursue higher education so that they can try and get more money. So I think that there's, I've known people who are bartenders at night, maybe nurses by day, you know, bottle service girls by night, but teachers, something else by day. So, you know, this is common and people kind of look down on people who do bottle service because, you know, it's, it can be seen as promiscuous and whatnot, bartenders, whatever. But, um, I don't personally have a problem with it. But like I said, if someone's going to bring it to light, well, then the judgment needs to go both ways. Like there's a guilty verdict that needs to go to everybody. If we're going to shame the person for putting out the content, then we need to shame the person for watching it. But then you find out that she was doing with her husband or her her partner, her boyfriend, whatever. Um, so I was kind of like, I mean, they're keeping it in the family. It's not like. What, I don't know what exactly they were putting out there, but they were doing it together. Uh, both were fired. I don't think it was necessary. I think she actually quit. She quit. He was fired? I think she was on leave. Okay. And then actually just ended up quitting. Okay. I think it had, it to your point, had it not been done on school property, which is technically, is it city property or federal public schools are, I think they're city property. Um, I could see how that could be an issue. Like, yeah. Sure. Don't do that. But other than that, if it was just like she was making OnlyFans in her basement or in her garage, more power to you. I hope you're making enough like to supplement. Like that would make me assume that she really loves teaching. But her money that she's getting from OnlyFans is just, you know, really what the bread and butter is. Yeah. But I I thought it was it was necessary only because it happened on school grounds. Had it not, I don't think that this is something that needed to be a headline. But it yeah, not not smart to do it. To yeah. even if you are trying to block an entire an state. entire state from being able to view your, um, still not very smart to to do it on school grounds. I, I'm curious of like the interworkings of OnlyFans. Like when you like, do you sign up and pay for OnlyFans, or do you find like who you want to watch or engage with and pay them directly? Like how is the how is the plot split? so? If you remember season one of Rush Vibes, we I threw out some stats about OnlyFans, about creators and how much money they were making. Uh, I had to do a little bit of research to uh, get that information. So OnlyFans itself is free, I believe. Pretty sure. Where the money comes in is uh, if you find a creator who you want to follow, you subscribe. Um. I think you have subscription tiers that you can subscribe to, or you can just subscribe to individual content that they put out. Cause they pretty much put all their stuff behind. You can put individual posts behind paywalls. Okay. So you could be like, pay $7 to watch this video. Okay. Pay $7 to watch this, to look at these photos or whatever. Did you? No, I didn't pay money to like look that at anybody. Like that one time you signed up for one of those dating apps to do Christian research. Mingle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> I was not about to be finding nobody on Christian Mingle. But yes. I, for anyone who who doesn't know, there was a point in time where I was, um, I don't know what I would be called, but I was uh, someone 
I was working with someone. We were trying to put out a, a Christian based social media app. So we had an investor and developing and there was a whole bunch of stuff that was going. I never got off the ground for various reasons, but we were, it had assumed that Christian Mingo would be our uh, competitor because it was a Christian focused social media esque site. So I download, I signed up just to kind of see how it worked in case we wanted to ever have a dating element in our app. But he told never, me, he told me after the, the fact. Oh, of course, I didn't tell you while I was signing up. Why not? I wonder, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Why would I? <laughs> you, um, Christians keeping secrets. Whatever. Um, so speaking of marriage. Dating. <laughs> marriage. Uh, or divorce. You keep tripping. But um, you divorce you, me and I'm going to get every dollar I spent on your trip. Yeah, you can have it. Uh, let me pull up my notes up. Because there was this tweet, and I don't even know if TMR actually said this, but I'm assuming it's, it's true. I didn't see quotation marks in the tweet, so I was kind of confused as to where I the was. quote started yeah. and ended. But, but there was this tweet. It was trending, even on. Why'd you put these felon, I, these I felon white to, people in my, in my note? I wanted to contribute to them. I, they they going to jail. Um, so there was this tweet I came across. Um, I think maybe while we were in St. Lucia. The tweet said Tia Mari said her marriage was successful, but it ended because she had evolved. She spoke about divorce being a quote unquote graduation, not a failure. That success in a marriage is not about longevity, but if two people are happy together, that message is going to save some lives for real. So I was just curious what your thoughts were. Read it again. Uh, the Tia Mari portion is her marriage was successful, but it ended because she had evolved. She spoke about divorce being a graduation, not a failure. That success in marriage is not about longevity, but if two people are happy together. Uh, I mean, I. You also had like a week to read the. I did. The I quote. just needed to re. I just need to hear it again. <laughs> I'm just saying. I just needed that. All I need to do was hear it again. Okay. I'm so, I'm we about just, to graduate for real. I'm just saying you had the quote for, and I just wanted you to. to I just wanted to hear wanted, it again. You wanted to hear hear from my voice. I get it. I'll read it myself. Okay. Don't start with me. I'm just saying you had it for a week. I will say I think I understand where she's coming from. If this is the actual quote, these are the actual words she said. I think there are some. Well, mis- let's 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 take Tia Murray out of it. Let's just. I think there the, are some the concept mis- on it on itself. What do you think about divorce being not a failure but a graduation? I don't. I th- that's what I was going to say before I was interrupted. Um, is I think that we. I think there are some misused words in this statement. <sighs> I think I don't like the word graduation because graduation in my opinion comes off as you're you've elevated you've completed a study and, on to bigger and better things completed it yeah um and their divorce has been very am amicable sure so that kind of seems like a jab um I do agree that not all divorce needs to be considered failure. I think, but only if you, I think it's twofold because sometimes some people forced to get married just for the sake of getting married for status for, you know, that's just what I'm supposed to do at this age. Um, And they just get into a, a marriage with someone that they probably knew they shouldn't have gotten into a marriage with. So you've got that instance but I think if you don't do everything, if you marry the right person and, you know, that ev- evolve that she had mentioned, you know, sometimes you know, there are people who've been married for years, 20 years. And then, you know, they say they grew out of love. So I think that could be considered an evolution. But I think there's also work that needs to be done before 
you come to the conclusion of divorce is the best option for us. So have you sought therapy? Are you communicating? Have you talked, you know, your issues out? Or did you just wake up one day and be like, I've evolved, I'm graduating and we're divorcing. So that's my thought. Um, I just think there's misuse of, of words there. I, you know, that success in marriage is not about longevity, but if two people are happy together, but I think that kind of contradicts because a lot of people see successful marriages as long marriages. Uh, I, I don't know. And maybe this is Tia or society changing what a successful marriage is. You know, is a successful marriage having kids, you know, who are happy and healthy, um, which I don't know because divorce typically affects kids very harshly. You know, so I think I think it contradicts what we as society see as a successful marriage. You know, when people say, you know, they've been married 40 years, those are the people you're usually like, you know, what's your advice? What, you know, what advice do you have for your long marriage? And then they'll tell you, you know, communication, blah, blah, blah. But I've never really heard someone asking someone who's been married four years and divorced, like, what's your advice on, you know, a successful marriage? Because from perspective, that's not a successful marriage because you're not in it. It didn't last. But I guess it depends on what the meter of success is in a marriage that would determine that. Is it just the fact that you had happy moments that you fell in love and now you're either no longer in love or whatnot? So I think that there's some complexity in the statement itself. That's why I wasn't sure if it was something she said for real, because it just felt like it was lacking in terms of the depth that it needed to fully make sense for me. I think what they're, they were 12 or 14 years. So they've been, they were together for a long time, um, which in itself, I guess could be considered successful. But when I think of long marriages, that's usually what I attribute success to. Like that's if nobody died or anything. Um, and someone didn't become a widow or widower. Uh, so, but I think a lot of this at the same time just comes down to where are you in your marriage? Are you, I assume that someone gets a divorce because they're just not happy in their marriage. Uh, things aren't working, that they've put in the work, they've gone to therapy, they've gone to counseling, they've had conversations, things aren't improving. And the best thing for both of them mentally, physically, emotionally is to part ways. That's my perspective. So, but I'm not currently seeking divorce. I'm not in the middle of a divorce. So I can't speak to what someone needs. And I also don't know that it's my place to truly have an opinion. Like I would always vote for someone to not get a divorce because, you know, if, if all aspects are healthy and, you know, if no one's being abused in any way, um, I'd say, you know, do what you can to work at it. Uh, but with that same respect, I'm not in that marriage. I'm not in, you know, that household. And I understand I've, you know, I think everyone has been in a situation where you've lived with someone or you've been near someone who's not in a good space and that affects you and that affects the entire mood. And if, you know, for your mental health, you recognize that this just is not a healthy environment for me to thrive and that results in divorce, by all means, do it. So it's like, I, it, it's, a, it's twofold where I don't really feel like I can have an opinion on it. And I feel like my opinion on it could be seen as old school per se. But at the end of the day, it's your life and it's what is best for you and your life. And if you feel that the situation you're in isn't good for you and you've changed, evolved, and you need to do something else, then by all means do that. Um, and we all wish you the best, but myself personally, I just think that there are certain words that were misused. I just don't like the use of the word graduation because then it makes it seem like, oh, I just need to get married and graduate to divorce. That's my thought. And I also don't feel like I like, I don't like anything that kind of makes like marriage is a very permanent thing. It's supposed to be a permanent thing. And between all of these reality shows, you've got Married at First Sight, you've got Love is Blind, Ultimatum, all of these shows, 
where people say they want to get married and then they do the stuff that comes with marriage and realize like you truly don't understand marriage until you're in it. Like a lot, I've, I've heard people, you know, be engaged and like, Oh, you know, we might as well just get married because we've been doing this for so long. Um, something about when merit, when it becomes permanent in paper, a beat in front of witnesses, it's very different. Like it's a breakup is when you're dating, when you're engaged compared to a divorce though, like, there's power in the word divorce. You need attorneys, you need, you know, you you need to have different kinds of conversations, different people. You're now separating families. Whereas, you know, when you break up, it's like you go your, if there are no kids involved, no properties, you go your way, I go mine. We never have to see each other again. Um, Divorce is more permanent because you stood in front of people and said, we're, we have committed our lives to each other. So I think like I watch these shows and I always get that always what annoys me because you see people who are like, oh, you know, I've dated and I run the field and I'm just ready to be somebody's wife. And it's that's not that shouldn't be your reason for wanting to get married is that you just want to be someone's wife and you want to have kids. There's so much with it, like the partnership that comes in marriage is so profound you have ups, you have downs, you have to be someone's champion. You have to be someone's cheerleader. You, you know, someone has to be that for you as well. You have to know like this season is your season to be hot. This is my season to be cold. You have to be selfish. You have to be selfless. Like there's so much more than just, I want to be someone's, at least from the female perspective, I want to be someone's wife. I want to have babies. That's a component of marriage. Those are two components of marriage, but there's so much more, you know, you might have fertility issues. That's something within a marriage you have, you don't usually know until you're in it. That's something you have to work through together. I mean, you could have family issues. You could have financial issues. There are so many issues that you can have. So I really get upset when people kind of simplify it and assume like, oh, if it doesn't work out, we just get a divorce. Like, that's usually not like that's it's not that simple it's like you need to put in the work for it and so these kind of statements i get where she's coming from i think um i'm not i haven't had a conversation with t i don't know her so i i have to make assumptions i don't even know if this is really her quote um from this, I get like my mental health, my, you know, I just needed to be in a different environment and this marriage wasn't allowing me to thrive. But I also don't want statements like this for people who are in healthy ish marriages that just need a tune up to assume like, Hey, I'm just going to call it because I've evolved. I've graduated. So that's, that's kind of where I stand on that matter. So the car that just pulled up across the street is playing Same Girl. By R. Kelly? In Russia. I should walk across the street like, we don't play that here. We don't do that here. It's 12.30 in the morning. I'm just trying to figure out why their music's playing loud enough that I can tell exactly what song they're playing. Let's make sure none of our kids have been awoken. Um, so that was a lot. Um, clearly marriage is one of those topics that gets you fired up a little bit. Uh, in terms of the quote or the concept of marriage as a graduate, marriage, divorce as a graduation. I actually don't have an issue with it. Okay. I, I think I haven't, um, she awake? No, but just the way she's sleeping. Which one? Sally. Oh. Um, I think it's, it's different. It's a different way of looking at it. Um, but I mean, how often do we talk about seasons, Mm -hmm. right? And, And certain things are for a certain season. And once that season is over, you move on to the next one. So, I mean, why... I guess in my mind, why couldn't divorce be a graduation if if it wasn't necessarily unsuccessful based on your your parameters? It's been completed, right? So if you're moving on to the next thing, then technically that would be 
a graduation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it all comes down to the individual, and maybe in some cases the couple, uh, in terms of what success is, because success isn't the same thing for everybody. Um, whether it's marriage, whether it's personal goals, whether it's whatever, like success is sub- subjective. Um, so if this is, if this quote is true, they went 14 years, they had kids, they had success, they had, I'm sure ups, downs, but for the most part, it, you know, they were able to make a good life of it, but for whatever reason, it's, it's time for them to go on their separate ways. I don't, I don't see how that couldn't be. I don't see why there would be an issue with looking at that as sort of a, of a graduation because in my mind, you you set forth on um, a path. Like if you just because we're using graduation, just use school as an, as an example. You start sixth grade, knowing that you've got three years to go through until you can get to high school, and you've got things that you have to accomplish. You accomplish those things, and you move on to you move on to high school. Um, it's kind of hard to compare that to a marriage, but. I don't, know, I don't necessarily have an issue with it. I don't know that every divorce situation is like that, mm-hmm. but I think it's possible for divorce to be looked at as a graduation. Absolutely. I uh, think it opens a conversation, a, a the topic for a broader conversation in terms of before you marry someone, determining what success is in your marriage. Because like you're mm-hmm. like we're using the term graduation. I started we're, since we have to do school as the example. I started university in two thousand eight to pursue my bachelor's. Three different schools later in two thousand nineteen I got my 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 degree. Mm-hmm. I graduated with my degree. Mm-hmm. So You know, that's 11 years Mm -hmm. of a process that I find to be successful Mm -hmm. because my end goal was to get a diploma. But with marriage, is your end goal to get a divorce? Like, I guess that's where it's like, what is, what are we considering? If we were dating and we're having the conversation, what would we say would make our marriage successful? Having healthy, having, you know, building capital, owning property, having a house, you know, not having debt, having kids, when you achieve all those things, is like Monopoly. Like I've gotten all these things. Well, uh, oh, bye. No, I. And maybe I'm looking at it too linearly. That yeah, I, it's I hard for me to see evolution and graduation as a successful part of. Like, if you're in an unhealthy marriage, get out. I that's I, that's firm where I stand. If you feel like your marriage is not prosperous for you, get out. But I just don't like the simplification and maybe because I'm in a marriage and I'm not saying discrediting how hard she's working, but, or worked. I'm, I I put in work. We've had our rough patches. We've had our difficult moments, but we came through, we communicated whatever we had to do, but to simplify it as I've, we've graduated, I've graduated, I've graduated from this relationship. Why does that come? Why does that strike you as a simplification of marriage? It, it just comes off as a, I don't like, like using the word escape because again, I don't want to discredit bad marriages, marriages that are unhealthy, that are unsafe for people to be in. But for people who rough patches come up in marriages, you're constantly, you evolve within your marriage. You're constantly changing as a person, your goals, your aspirations, your desires, you, the person you start off married as is not the person 10 years in, like we're almost 10 years in. I am not the same Jessica I was at 24. You know, I'm a mother of three now, you know, I, I've changed physically, emotionally, mentally. So if you discredit that evolution within marriage is required because no one stays the same and just make it seem like, I don't know. I hear that. And I just think like, it's above me now. Like I'm just not here. And like, I'm, I, I have become too good to be in this. Marriage. Like it just does. It doesn't come off as I'm working 
in this marriage. And again, I could just be seeing it too linearly, but, and maybe because I feel like the word graduation is an end point. I've like, once you graduate, like you're, you've completed this task of learning. So to apply the word grad, and, and I think it's, I'm very weird with words. I think it's, it's just me. If someone had used a different, if she, if the quote was used with a different word, maybe I'd see it like this. My marriage lasted this season and I just don't foresee other seasons being fruitful, um, being prosperous. Like, I think that's where it is. Whereas opposed to, you know, now the quote underneath that tweet was, or the tweet underneath that quote was, Oh, this is going to save a lot of women, blah, blah, blah. And I think if we just, focus on if you are not in a good marriage and it is not healthy and it's not savable leave i'm not telling anyone to stay in a bad marriage but i just don't i feel like terminology like that just gives off the same feel of divorce is an escape divorce is a way out if it doesn't work like if you need a way out you don't need to be getting married like divorce is supposed to be the absolute last option so graduation you as an individual can graduate from in seasons and places I, I can see it from that perspective but when you apply it to something that is supposed to have longevity like a marriage I don't see it and I don't know that we can really change the narrative and be like your marriage can be successful if you ended in divorce because from my perspective this is my opinionated truth it's not successful if it ended in divorce. There's, you weren't you either weren't compatible, you grew out of love with each other, it wasn't healthy, well, all the reasons I've listed before. So I think that's where I'm struggling because, and that's why I said, well, then you need to determine what success is. Because for me, a successful marriage is longevity, like you die or I die before we get out of it. You know, we have our ups and downs, but we have love for each other. We love each other, we're in love with each other, we're passionate, we've created We've created an environment that has raised happy, healthy children who have seen an example of a healthy marriage that has its ups, that has its down. But at the end of the day, mom and dad always came back together. That Those are examples of a healthy marriage. Healthy marriage, successful marriage. You know, we travel, we see the world together. We can enjoy each other's company. We can laugh, we can cry, we can... I can support you in your season. You can support me in my season. You know, I can push you. You can push me. I can be upset with you and come back and forgive you. Same, same thing in reverse. So those, but all of those things are longevity. If we divorced at four years, that's not a successful marriage. And I still have so much more life to live. So again, I'm not demonizing divorce because I understand that sometimes it's necessary. I support it when it's necessary, but I don't support making it seem like it is an easy exit plan. It's like when you go to Ikea and they have like, you can either go the entire route of the store or they have like the quick access exit. That's what this comes off as like, oh, I've graduated. Like, I don't need to go to the lights. I don't need to go to the Tupperware. I'm just going to leave here. So again, it could just be the wording of it is what's complicating it for me. But I just don't, I respect marriage so much that I don't, and I respect anyone who makes vows to get into marriage so much that I just don't appreciate anything that simplifies it and makes it seem like it's less than what the agreement of marriage actually is. And I think graduation and evolve simplify marriage. Because I feel like if I came to you and said, David, this is a graduation. We need to get a divorce because I've evolved. I don't feel like you would support that. So I think you're one, I think you're conflating looking at it as a graduation and successful. I think you're putting those two things together. Well, graduation when I don't, I don't, success. And I don't know that I don't know that's necessarily the, sorry, the case and I'll tell you what I mean by it, but also it's not, I've graduated. Let's get a divorce. 
I'm, I, or at least how I interpret it is we're getting a divorce. This is how I see it. Not this is what I feel I'm ready for. Let's get it. I I'm ready to graduate. Let's get a divorce. It's we got a divorce. I'm, I'm being reflective of everything that we've been through accomplished, not accomplished. And I'm, looking at it as this and this is a graduation because this is probably like a bookend to a certain part of my life and I'm moving on to the next one. That's how I see graduation. You've completed something. Now it's time for the next, the next leg up or the next thing, the next chapter. Now, um, what did I say before conflating, graduation success. Um, you don't, what was I going to say? Oh, I had it. Um, one, I think just everybody sees one marriage differently. Not everyone sees it the same way you or I see it. You and I may not even see it exactly the same. Um, and everybody views success differently. So let's say you sit down before you get married, you're engaged and you write out what success would look like. And we agree on a list. Let's say we hit, we put down 15 things. We put, we hit 10 of them, but at 20 years, we decide for whatever reason that we want to get divorced. We completed 10 out of 15 things. Is that not success? Maybe it's not for you, but maybe it is for me because we look, we sat down and said, our marriage will be successful if we complete this number of things we got a high number of them completed. Unfortunately, we feel it's best to move on or move, go our separate ways. But does that, because we decided to get divorced, does that mean the 10 or 11 things that we accomplished, the good times we had, the, the love that we shared, the moments we had, does that mean that they just, they're just null and void? Maybe, maybe, right. Maybe for some people, um, I don't know that I would necessarily see it that way. It would still suck to get a divorce. Um, and I'd, it'd be a while before I could be Mr. Silver lining and glass half full about it. But someone could look at it and be like, wait, well, hey, I mean, we were still, I could see it as a success, even though at the end of the day, we're walking away from each other. Um, so I, I don't get as caught up on, graduation seeming like, um, I don't know how you described it, but I just think it's someone saying for me, this was a period of my life. I've got kids. We accomplished these things. We grew. It's not working out for whatever reason. Um, we're mutually agreeing to divorce it's a graduation because I'm moving, I'm moving on to the next thing in my life. Uh, that's, that's how I see it. I, I don't think, I don't see it as a, um, simplification of, of marriage. I don't think that it's going to encourage people to, um, that they can just walk away at any point of marriage and deem it a success just because they say it is. I mean, I, I feel like, only I, th I feel like only a certain person would have that sort of mindset anyway, that you don't have to worry about just anybody saying, oh, what's well, a graduation girl? I don't, I don't know. We may only been together for like two months, <laughs> but I'm graduating. I mean, I, I don't know. That's something you got to worry about, but I, th I just thought it was, a, it was a different way of looking at divorce that I hadn't quite thought of because there is such negativity around mm -hmm. divorce. Um, and a lot of people, you can attribute that to, to religion and um, things like that, or just the fact that it costs money. <laughs> it's a lot of money to get divorced and it's usually messy. And if there's kids involved, like you said, but you know, I, I was just like, Oh, this is kind of interesting. And I, I figured you would be, you'd have opinions and I was right. So it's a good thing. I know my wife, that's a successful marriage, knowing your wife, knowing what gets her, <laughs> gets her going. All right. Um, Hour and 30 minutes. So 15 minutes. No, we're still going. 18 minutes. Because we'll stop at hour 45. 
Let's talk about this kids and Owen quote that you reshared. Because I'm pretty sure we're going to disagree on this. Okay. Read the quote. Did you share my... You did put it in the note, didn't you? Of course I did. Share my Facebook. I shared it with you. <laughs> it's loading. Okay. So this is the quote I shared. It said, your child doesn't owe you anything. No good grades, no good moods, not nights without waking up, not eating every bite, not loving every activity, not yes. Your child doesn't owe you anything just because you're an adult. Sit with this for as long as you need. So I, as I've become a mother of one to two to three, my, my expectations, I'll start with this. I grew up from a culture where it's emphasized all the sacrifices parents make for their kids. And for myself personally, I have found that that has put me in a position where I feel like I'm constantly in debt because someone took it upon themselves to make sacrifices for me. Sacrifices I didn't know about, sacrifices I didn't, you know, condone, sacrifices I didn't ask for. Yet I have this debt of gratitude of appreciation of being successful because someone made decisions for my life and i say this i appreciate every sacrifice that has been made for me my parents my dad specifically always said he wanted to have his children abroad while he was in ghana that was something he said so whether it was london germany canada the u.s he knew for a fact his children were going to be born in another country where they would have more opportunity because he recognized that his country did not provide the opportunity he wanted for his kids. All decisions he's made for me before I existed, before I was to be here. Again, I appreciate all of this, but with that, I have carried a very heavy burden of, I need to be successful in my life. I need to make my parents proud because of everything they gave up. My dad specifically gave up for me. And that has been a lot for me. And I feel like I haven't truly enjoyed my life to its fullest because I'm always trying to compensate for this. And it's something that I have grappled with, with therapists, with myself, with God. And because I've dealt with it, this is a pressure I don't want to apply to my own children, especially the fact that I have three daughters. So no, I, as much as I want my kids to sleep through the night and I'm thankful every time they do, they don't owe me it because they're children. People have bad dreams. People need to use the bathroom. People just wake up and realize that they want someone in the bed next to them. But it comes down to child one, two, and three did not ask to be here. Granted, I also didn't plan for them to be here, but children come to the world because you either had an accident and got pregnant or you were intentional about working to get pregnant. But no child knocks on your door. There are a few instances where a child requests you to be their parent. You participate in an act and you have a child. That's, that's my foundation. So it's as a parent, I feel it's my job to set, these people up for success because they did not ask to be here, but they've been, I have been given the responsibility because I was either responsible or irresponsible with my body and got them. That's, that's, you know, it might sound blunt, you know, even, you know, Christians will be like, Oh, Lord to be fruitful and multiply. He did. But at the end of the day, these children did not ask to be here. So who am I to put an unnecessary burden on them. All of this opinion, all of my feelings is just based off of me and what I've been through in my life. Yes, I want to expose my kids to as much as possible. So the girls do dance. The older two do dance. I plan on having Sonoma do dance. Um, but I want them to play sports to, you know, if they, I feel like they're good at art, let's find art camps. Um, these are all expenses to me. If they find success in one of those things, I don't have the expectation that they are supposed to 
pay for my housing, that they are supposed to take care of me when I'm old. Out of the goodness of their heart, I hope I raise them well enough that they will love me and you enough that if there's a situation where they need to care for their parents, they will. But I also plan on us setting ourselves up for success that we don't need to be dependent on our children. Um, but I, I think, and again, a lot of this is cultural based. There's a lot of expectation that when children are, are babies, they're little and cute. They can get away with everything. And then there's an age range where children are supposed to be seen and not heard. And then there's a point where you need to become successful so that I can boast about your success. I will boast about my kids no matter what they do. I will, I am at the ages that they are now, I am proud of every single thing they do, whether it be unfortunately drawing on the walls, it's a moment of they're still super creative. That's, that's a really good picture. I hate that they did it on our walls, but that's a great picture. Um, but I just don't believe in putting kids in debt and I don't believe in putting expectations. Now, yes, I still expect you to be respectful because you're human, but I've said this to you. I've said this to many others. I'm raising adults. I, I, they're the, the way a, the window of being a child is, is short. You know, a baby, the, the age of being a baby is one year and they graduate to being a toddler. Then they're a kid. Then they're a preteen. Then they're a teenager. Then they're an adult and they spend the rest of their life as an adult. So, yes, I want them to enjoy the innocence of being a kid, but especially the fact that they are three women. I am raising them to be adults. We, we but I have my own ways of which I'm doing things. So I'm speaking from my perspective as a mother, uh, as a mother, a woman who's raising other women. That's why I'm very firm about. But we, but we, we, we have raise, different but, life but, but, but we raise them together and we discuss how we raise them mm -hmm. together and we, and we, and we share our desires and our wishes mm -hmm. for them with each other, with the expectation that the other is either on board or will come to uh, an agreement on how we want to raise. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's just the thing for me. It bothers me when, when you say I'm going to, when it pertains to our kids, because we talk about these things and you say, hey, I want to put the girls in the dance. I'd be like, yeah, okay, all right, whatever. You roll your eyes and you're like, we're going to put this one in the dance. <laughs> yeah, too. I mean, but that's just what I do. But Savi looks cute when she's out there in her little, her little tutu. Um, leotard, excuse me. So I'm just going to be annoying about everything that costs money. That's just the David experience. But there's nothing you've said that you want to do for the girls where I've been like, absolutely not. Yeah. But, but I mean, you all, but you come to me with those things, mm -hmm. and you express to me but because stuff because I haven't come to you about. Well, sure, but I would hope it's not anything that involves how you're raising them, because that's one something I need to be aware of, no, and mean, two, it it's something is. I need to be on board with because they're half mine as well. Okay, so as I was saying, our um, kids, I am very intentional as a woman raising three women to emphasize them being firm about what they say. If they don't want something, if they change their mind about something, they have those rights just because not everyone raises their boys a certain way. I've been in instances where as a woman, I've felt obligated to say yes, because that's how society has, has trained things. So I am very big about making sure, like even sometimes when you're roughhousing with them and, you know, so I'll also say stop. Or, you know, you can tell that they're kind of like at their their wit's end and you can still keep going. It takes a lot for me to withstand like not intervening because I really want them to understand that when they say no to someone, even if that someone is their dad, that they have the authority to know that my no needs to be respected. So those are the things that I, I, I say I do because as a man, that's a circumstance you've probably never faced. So it's very important that as I'm, from my part of raising them into womanhood, into adulthood, that they understand the power of their voice and they use it firmly. And they also understand that I can say yes to something now, but I can change my mind and say no. And if I'm in an uncomfortable situation, I can use my voice, which is why I'm very intentional about like when, you know, 
solace like start to get in the whiny voice lately i'll just be like you need to speak clearly you need to make sure you communicate clearly Amen. because those type of those unfortunately the world we live in that can leave room for misinterpretation so that's where i'm coming from with that because these are circumstances i've been in but i feel like i can do that because now explaining it to you i'm sure you 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 see where i'm coming from 100 on board so um, i hate the whiny voice but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. All of that I said, it's the one. I mean, that voice. too, but you, that was the last thing you mentioned. So that was like the bookend. Anyway, so no, I don't feel that kids, oh, good grades are good to accomplish. And I think a lot of it is just the favor you have with the kids that you are given, given and the environment of which you raise them in. Um, but I think I'm also in a place, it took me 11 years to get my bachelor's degree. Maybe it's because of the way I was I was learning. I didn't always get good grades. So who am I as a hypocrite to be like, you need to get good grades. You need if you're doing everything in terms of studying and learning and maybe the style of learning doesn't work for you. And, you know, unfortunately, you're getting a C. Well, I, I don't want you to be unfair to yourself because you took some breaks, one due to furthering your professional career mm -hmm. you went on some you took some positions that you hadn't had before you got some tour experience um you saw some really big professional success and once you got to a place where you felt like we were stable you said you wanted to go back but then you had been gone so many years that you weren't quite sure what you wanted to go back so there was a feeling out process in terms of what major you wanted to have so you change majors and then that actually set you back because credits don't transfer things like that so it w i don't maybe early on before we started dating maybe your grades weren't that great but i think as long as we've been together it's not a lack of uh ability or your ability to get good grades it's just life circumstances and decisions you made which which is fine because ultimately you finished mm -hmm. but it's, it's it's not just it wasn't bad grades or you're not your inability to learn it was you were figuring it out but yeah, to my initial point, no, I don't think kids owe good grades because you have a lot of kids who worked really hard in school and carried so much pressure and cracked. Some people thrive, some people don't. I think a lot of it is also, it's important to know your child and learn your child. Um, I want my kids to have good grades. I want them to be successful in everything they do but I also want them to be comfortable coming to me with everything. If they struggle in a space, if they're not doing well, if they don't understand something. And so I think parenting is a balancing act. I think, you know, someone might hear this and just, you know, recognize that maybe I'm being too lenient. Maybe I'm applying too much of, because the thing with parenting is you either do everything that your parents did you do half or you go completely opposite because you're so against it. Um, so I just, I want my kids to thrive organically. I want them, you know, I'll take moments of pushing them into things, but I don't ever, I just don't feel like I want them to be in debt to me. Um, do they owe me good moods? No. Would I prefer them to be in a good mood? Yes. I don't want, I won't tolerate disrespect. Um, but we're humans. Even as adults, we have bad attitudes. And I think that's maybe where people will struggle with with my perspective is that I try to because I'm focused on raising them as adults, because we know that they're only going to be children for 18 years per society. And then they become adults and they spend the rest of their life in adulthood. I think it's natural to for them to be able to express when they're not in a good mood. You have bad moods. I have bad moods. Sometimes I wake up and like this morning, I woke up and the first thing you asked me was if I was taking them out. There was no good morning. There was no like, hey, it was just straight in. And I, I feel like that just threw my mood off. No, no fault of you at all. It just threw my mood off. And if I'm entitled to that as an adult, imagine as a kid. I just think we don't give kids enough credit. Like their their minds are always constantly developing. Environments are changing. You know, you go your first grade, you jump to second grade. Like there's so much that goes into being a child. Yes, an adult, being an adult is tough. You know, you're paying bills, you're responsible for people. But just imagine like you're learning yourself in this world, but 
you also don't fully have autonomy over your life and your decisions. So I'm okay. That's why like Savi's been having a lot of bad moods. And I don't know if you've noticed I've lately she's been, I'm taking a minute. I need privacy. And, and she's two. And I encourage it. Of course, if she's in a bad situation, I don't want her to isolate herself. But I also appreciate that she recognizes that right now this space isn't for me. And I just need a moment to be upset, whether it be because someone said, no, I can't have any more juice or Sonoma touched my tablet. I need a minute. So, yes, I think. Kids deserve the same grace that we give adults. Yes, they might not pay bills. They might not, you know, truly contribute financially, monetarily to the home, but they are citizens. They are residents. They, they, they might not get to vote, but their opinions, their feelings, they're all valid. And we can't say that feelings are valid and not respect when someone's in a bad mood um, and not send someone and send someone away when they're in a bad mood. Cause when we're in bad moods, like we still sit on the couch and our bad mood is around everybody. So no, I don't feel like they owe, they owe us that. Um, they don't need to love every activity. Yes, it's hurtful when you go through all the effort to do something for your kids and your oldest is just kind of like... We're an hour 45 minutes, by the way. I didn't want to do this topic and you thought we could do it in 15 minutes. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Yes, it does. It can hurt your feelings as a parent when you go through a lot of effort to do something great for your kids and you're like, I expect their eyes to be bright and excited and they're just kind of like, is it time to go home yet? But you've planned stuff for me. I've planned stuff for you and it's been a dud. And it's just kind of like, dang, I really thought they were going to enjoy this. We're human. We have feelings like your feelings don't graduate when you get to a certain age, you have the same babies have bad moods. Babies get like everybody, every age group at any point of time, you have all the feelings that carry you throughout the rest of your life. It's just a matter of knowing how to interpret it. Um, I've never really been one to force the kids to eat. I think that that's, that channels obesity. Like, I want you to have a few bites here and there. I think you're confused over why I wanted us to talk about this. It was more the general theme of children not owing adults anything, not necessarily oh, line by well line. Then talk, say something. Don't just sit there quiet. I, well, I get in trouble when I interject because then I'm interrupting you and then it becomes a thing. But as a woman, I like to make sure my thoughts are understood. Fair point. But, um, that's a bit of that's the that's the internal struggle I have with interrupting because then it could be seen as rude. Whereas sometimes I'm just trying to steer us back on course. Not that we were off course, but I think you misinterpreted what I wanted us to discuss. Okay. Interpret it for me. Uh, well, you were considering that you were going <laughs> line by line on the meme. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you misunder or misinterpreted what I wanted, which is fine because I just put it on there. I didn't actually um, give any sort of guidance. So that's my bet. Mm -hmm. So I apologize. This is me trying to correct that by stopping you from going line by line. I've gone through most of it. So hour 46 minutes. Okay. It's going to be a two hour episode. Um, so first things first. Um, I think, and when this, this might actually be cultural for once. I know like normally when you say that, I roll my eyes because I feel like sometimes it's kind of like a cop out. But in this case, I believe it absolutely is true. So because my parents, I would imagine, or at least when they were raising me, maybe now because they're old and progressive and, and seasoned. Uh, but when I were raising me, I'm pretty sure that they would say, yes, I owe them because of what they've done for me. Right. I feel like they're owed. It's different from the O that you express. So, and that's maybe where that's where the culture comes into play because there's no way that um, my parents would allow me to carry the kind of, that kind of debt, like through my adult life um, that they made all these sacrifices. So now I got to be ultra uber mega successful and, you know, pay all the bills and blah, 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 blah. They, they wouldn't ask that. Um, so I concede and don't agree with that whatsoever. Like, I don't, I don't feel like when Solace is 25, she should be like, man, mom and dad did this for me, but I'm not like, I'm not doing better than they were. Like, I'm not making all this money. I'm not 
I'm not able to buy them a car yet. I'm not able to pay off their mortgage. So I'm, I got to keep going until I can do that. Like I would never want her. I would never want that thought to get anywhere near her mind, let alone be in it. So um, kind of the first I'm hearing of it, although I heard a, a semblance of it, probably like um, uh, some residuals of it this past week. When, when did we come home? Saturday, Sunday, when we were talking on the uh, on the patio, you were kind of telling me about um, your retreat and some of the things that you battle with. But um, first, I've heard like you feeling like you walk around with debt because of how your parents, specifically your dad, um, things that he said to you or whatever. So I'm sorry, sorry about that. Uh, and let me know how I can support you through that and obviously keep going um talk talking about it in therapy and whatnot but um and this is with me agreeing with everything that you said in terms of how we raise our kids uh but i do think that yes there are certain things that kids owe adults and and that's with completely understanding that yes, the whole reason they're here is because of something I did, but like, how are you going (laughs) to, maybe it's just, I don't know. I don't understand how you're going to be somewhere um, and enjoy the benefits of, of that decision. Life procreate, you know, creation uh, and not feel like, that you owe a baseline of something to uh, to the adult. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and I know that that's adult logic when we're, when we're talking about kids, but that's where the instruction comes from. Mm-hmm. You instruct them, you, um, you teach them things, teach them manners, you let them know how you run your household, how they're to act when they're in that household and how they're act when you leave. Um, so that understanding of yes i owe my parents respect yes i owe adults respect or teachers respect or whatever that comes from the instruction so i don't expect kids to know that like straight out the womb like oh my gosh like i don't want their first words to be oh i owe you father but as they get older and hopefully by us speaking to them as adults they understand like Hey, this is, I'm only able to experience this because somebody has provided this for me. Mm -hmm. So therefore I do owe them at least respect a yes when, when they ask for it, because that's part of the instruction. Um, okay. Maybe you don't owe me good grades, but when I was growing up, that was the expectation. I owed it to myself, but, um, I definitely owed it to my parents because, you know, They, they gave me the opportunity to go to school. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, it, I, I, there's a very fine line and there's a very delicate balance between um, giving kids the space to be creative, to express themselves, to experience emotions um, and deal with those emotions um, and, and then there's also, there's a balance bet- between that and then just kind of letting them like have total autonomy. And I think that that's, it's tough. And that, I mean, that's what parenthood is, right? Like you just, you have to figure it out. Um, and I don't know that anyone gets it right all the time, but I worry that memes like that, I guess without context, without, um, full fleshing out so to speak can kind of encourage people to raise kids in a way that they but they kind of just you know just kind of do whatever mm-hmm. and, that, and that bothers me um and it and it and it it worries me because you know what people live in like 70, 80 years on average now. So eventually these kids 
are going to be making decisions in the world that I'm living in when I'm in a retirement home. And I want to make sure that these these children I'm having a little bit of fun at this point, but in all seriousness, I mean, how people are raising their kids. I mean, these are the future leaders of tomorrow. Mm hmm. Uh, as corny as it and cliche as it is, I mean, it's the truth. Like, where else is leadership going to come from? I mean, eventually, like Mitch McConnell and Nancy Nancy Pelosi, they're going to die, and we're going to need new people in, in Congress. So, you know, I'm just, I, I, I don't think that kids should, like, you know, when we come down, like, we come downstairs in the morning, they should, like, bow down and, like, worship at our feet. I don't think that that's necessary. I think that that's you know, obviously wild and outlandish, but um, I, I don't think it's, I don't see anything wrong with saying that, yes, I, I think they do owe me and you, us, as their parents, some things. Um, because just like they didn't ask to be here, um, they wouldn't be here if it weren't for us. So I feel like that cuts both ways. Number one, uh, but number two, it's not like you're not being like a, a ruthless dictator or an authoritarian uh, by, you know, setting those expectations for them um, that, yes, they, they do owe you a certain baseline of things. Uh, but you can still give them everything that you said, everything that we do give them, uh, the space to grow and, and experience and, and whatever. Those things can can exist. I don't think that they're necessarily mutually exclusive. But I have a question before you respond. So you said children don't owe adults anything because they asked to be here. Um, I just want to say, is that is that actually how you feel? Like you agree with that statement? Yeah. Okay. I think now this is not me discrediting just being respectful and dis no, I'm just, discipline and all of that. Just in general. Um, and I definitely recognize your point. I do see like, okay, I, I'm putting a roof over your head. I'm transporting you. You know, you're having birthday parties, all of this. But a lot of things parents, I don't have to do. This is true. But a lot of parenting is what you as a parent expectations, because a lot of parenting is essentially giving your kids what you didn't have. Um, I think that's almost foundational is making sure that your kids have a better, even if you had a great childhood, a great growing up experience, you still want to give your kid greater. Um, a lot of parenting is raising yourself and raising yourself in your kid. I've read that before where it's just, their experiences, feelings you longed for and didn't get to have as a kid. So you want to live that through your child. Um, I think, you know, you had mentioned these people are going to be making decisions for us. Are we even happy with the people who are currently making decisions for us? Because how they were raised is a reflection of the decisions that they're making for a greater population of people. So yes, I know parents are a little more freestyle when it comes to raising their kids, but I think a lot of it is simply because of situations like where I am right now, where I see, or I'm, I'm living, or I'm, I'm trying to free myself of burdens that I didn't want to have to carry. So I think past generations, and it's definitely twofolded because you think of, like I was raised you know, everyone talked about how horrible Joe Jackson was, but then they would also say Michael Jackson wouldn't be Michael Jackson if Joe Jackson wasn't terror wasn't the way, the way he was. So I recognize that too, that there, there, there's a potential for backfiring. So it's like a check. It's a balancing act of, Oh, is Savi playing on that piano upstairs? Is it for fun? And I realize she's good. And then, you know, get her into piano lessons and then you know, do you force her to continue to do it? And then maybe she loses the passion for it, but she's still really good. So I think I will, I will actually take back my initial state. I think, no, I won't take it back. I will say this. I think every day in parenting is different. And I think there are some days where you recognize that 
no, this child is an innocent person and is just here and deserves to enjoy life. And then I think there are days where you're like, I do need to push. I think a lot of that comes with recognizing your children. We've been fortunate with Solace where she's just kind of, she learns, she's got, she's well-mannered. We don't know that Savi and Sonoma are going to be like that. But I also think that with parenting, a lot of it is just example based. But that's, and but that's different. What you're describing is different than just the them the general belief. Like as as in general, do you believe that kids owe their parents anything other than love and respect? No. Because then you raise a generation of people pleasers. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it. I think it. I is. think you can, as I said, I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. I don't think. I don't think if you, if, I, if 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 you teach kids to understand, if you're of that belief that they they do owe you some things because of all that you've done for them, I don't know that that they automatically like they're just people pleasers as they grow up. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think like you and I've just said, it's a balance um, where, you know, you can give them everything that you, you said because they're young, they're developing. They don't, they don't, you know, they don't even know who they are. Um, They, they're experiencing things, emotions, the the swings and and all of that. Um, All that can happen and them still understand that, Hey, you know, I owe it to my mom. I owe it to my dad for, for certain things as they get older. Like, right. Like Salas, um, I think knows that all that she experiences because of, of you and I, mm-hmm. um, but you know, as she gets older, she'll start to understand what like a mortgage is, <laughs> what, what, uh, what a pace, what a pay cycle is. Mm-hmm. Um, you and, then, the store and, and then she'll be like, Oh, damn like but i think that comes with maturity well it does but i'm still saying you can still lay the groundwork for that as their kids through your instruction is what i'm saying i think that kids like one, one of the one of the lines i took exception to was um they don't owe you a yes Right. Because one of my things is um, and it, and I don't know if you realize it when I'm instructing them and I are correcting them and I say, do you understand me? And I need to hear you say yes. And they'll be like, I'm like, no, I need a yes. And I say, no, I need a yes. And I'll, I'll do it until they say yes. Um, they owe me that because I'm their father. And it's my job to instruct them on how to act. And what is okay and what is not okay, especially in my house in which they live, our house, excuse me, in which they live. Um, But that's also teaching them that how they're supposed to act, it goes beyond these walls and it evolves beyond these walls because what's expected, what's okay, it changes depending upon where you are. Mm -hmm. Um. So I need to hear them confirm that they understand what I'm saying, but it's also a thing of a matter of respect too, but I'm also telling them to use their voice. See, that's how I take it as you want a verbal confirmation. Yes. Of, you've heard what I said well, it's, and it's, you understand what I said. It's a lot of things, but also I want them to use the, as you mm-hmm. say, they're young women who need to learn how to speak definitively. And I want them to say, yes, I understand you. Cause that also encourages them to do that. Mm-hmm. Maybe not. It's not like saying, daddy, stop it. You know, stop wrestling with me or I want this, but it's still teaching them or maybe subconsciously, maybe directly that to speak loudly and speak clearly mm-hmm. when you, when you speak. Um, but I feel like, yes, they do owe me a yes when I ask for it. Now I'm not just going to walk, <laughs> be just busting in the room, like say yes, <laughs> like for no reason. And a lot of that is, is based on the kind of parent you are. Um, so that was just, I, I just took exception to, it seemed like somebody like the author of the, the post was saying children don't deserve, children don't owe parents anything. 
And I don't think that's the case. Um, and it seemed to be the premise was because they didn't ask to be here, but I would be curious. I'd be curious to know. I'm changing gears a little bit here. So stay with me. The people who feel like if that's the case, that because children didn't ask to be here, they don't owe us anything. Like, so how do you feel about student loans? Because the loan didn't ask to exist, right? You took the loan out. So are you going to, are you going to take, I don't stand <laughs> it's above me. So are you going to take, you going to take forgiveness or are you going to own up and pay the loan? Cause loans didn't ask to be here. I, you went out and saw them. You created the loans. Because I was told that I needed. That so I'm I just saying. My parents. A I'm degree. just saying. My father used to specifically say. I'm just saying. Used to say, bring me my degree. I'm it just, wasn't their degree. It was. I'm just saying. I would be curious to know. People who say kids don't owe you nothing because they ain't asked to be here. Well, neither did them loans. So I bet not see you petitioning for 10 to 20 G's off. Oh, I'm a petition all day. Yeah. Interesting. All day, every day. Yeah. A bunch I, I of will, you're a bunch of hypocrites. I think there's there's a broader conversation that can be had. I'm tired think, of broader conversations. I think a lot of I'm wrapping up, so calm down. Um, <laughs> no more I broader, no more broader conversations. A lot of parenting is by example. I don't. I will stand that I don't believe in debting kids. I think that childhood, especially before double digit, deserves an innocence, an innocence of exploration, an innocence of self discovery. And I think if you are favored to raise your kids well they will get to a point in their life where they recognize all the things that you as a parent are doing on their own sure i don't think you as a parent should have to put the extra burden where they carry it like i think i i hear interviews of like basketball players who always call their mom moms um, but they were like, my mom's, you know, work two jobs. My mom's Why this, you don't, mom. don't do that. I just know. No, don't, no don't I'm that. saying that no, because that's... they, no, don't, don't make assumptions. Um, I'm saying that because they have, they've gotten to a place of success and they recognize they got to that success because of the sacrifice their mothers made for them. No, you said, no, my please moms. don't put words or make assumptions as to why I said what I said. I'm okay. just saying, usually when they're interviewed, that's exactly how they say it. That's how they reference their mom. Okay. But so let me, but, that's. But no, 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 I get to respond. This is my podcast too. Okay. So as a black man, I'm going to let you know how sometimes it feels when people attack us for the way that we speak, because that's um, how, that's how moms are referred to by certain black men in I'm certain, in certain neighborhoods. Athletes. Yeah. And those black athletes come from those same environments, but you're like, no, them. I'm just I'm, letting you know that's that. Because so it's like the Laura, the Laura Ingraham thing when she went after LeBron and KD, the shut up and dribble. A lot of people, that's the only part of the quote that they remember. But if you watch the segment, which I did, the whole segment, she was attacking them because of the way that they spoke. And that's one thing that a lot of people do when they see a successful black man. They find ways to attack him because they've got wealth. So we got to find something else to attack them on. So what I'm letting, I know that you're not doing that, but what I'm telling you is, is that other people do it. Okay. So that can be triggering. In this context, what I'm trying I'm to let you know. People. I'm I know. letting you know the interviews that I've heard from people such as a LeBron, a Kobe, uh, you know, these yeah, significant that's they, that's basketball, moms. football player. Yes. Yeah, so that's I'm how they say, speak. That's, but the point that I was trying to make is they do interviews and they recognize that their mom has sacrificed for them and yeah. and I'm quoting what I've typically heard is they'll say my mom's did this my mom's did that and I don't ever get the context from them that while my mom was doing this she was also saying like you owe me this and when you get your first million you mm -hmm. buy me a house they buy they do these things out of the goodness of their heart because they recognize the sacrifice that came with maturity to sure. see it. i don't think a seven-year-old a nine-year-old can look and say oh my parents are doing all of this for me and i owe them i think you get to a certain age or you even into adulthood where you finally look back and that's when you realize like wow the only reason why i'm who i am today is because the sacrifices of my mom or my dad yeah that's the whole that i was trying to say but I was quoting yeah. what I've heard in interviews. No, but but also what you said was like I don't know why they say it like that. You you did that, right? I did. Okay, so that's the part that 
that is triggering. It doesn't but matter. I don't know why they say it like that. And I'm, but I'm, because <laughs> that's just how they speak. Like even I, even I refer to my mom as as mom sometimes. That's how black men refer to their mom. Okay, I'm not a black man. I know. I'm giving you insight, but I'm also letting you know be careful. That it how can you, be triggering. I'm also letting you know be careful how you how you reference it, and how you speak about it, because there are other people out there who try to attack black people in general, mm-hmm. right? But specifically black men for how they speak in their diction. <laughs> I'm not doing this. So I'm just, letting, I'm just letting you know, be careful. Okay. What I want to conclude on is that I still am a firm believer that childhood is very temporary. And we as parents are tasked to prepare our children to live in a world where they're not dependent on us. And I think even, you know, if you do a Bible, a biblical reference, you know, it says raise up a child in the way she go. Grow, and when they grow, depart from it, they True. will not depart from it. So I think I st- when I think of that and reference that scripture, it's futuristic. It's instilling now everything the child needs to be an ex- be a successful adult. And I think. Part of that is not weighing them down with things that they owe. Someone can also probably come back and be like, spare the rod, spoil the child. I get that. That's the problem. That's the problem using the Bible as your reference point. The the rod that we use in reference, yes, at a time might have been a physical thing. But I think a lot of it can be considered just being an example of being a good person in this world. Um, that is something that affects your kids. Your kids see how you engage with your partner, how you engage with other people, how you carry yourself. That's that. I think those are also things that can be figured to, or that are a physical, physical rod, but can still be, you know, if I don't show my kids a good example of A, B and C, how are they going? They're going to end up spoiled. So I think that's also, you know, um, something that should be considered, but I, I personally have expectations for my kids, um, but I, it's not an expectation that I want weighing them down. So if, you know, they are going to have a bad mood, you have a bad mood. I'm not going to be happy about it, but I have to respect the fact that you are a person and you have feelings and you're still learning how to manage your feelings. Cause at 32, I'm still figuring out how to learn how to manage my feelings too. So I think for me, it's just a mutual respect that I, I respect my child as a human, as a global citizen, and that they're figuring things out and I'm figuring things out and we are figuring these things out together. They're growing, I'm growing. So we've said it before, the parents that raised us are not the same people now. The parents that raised me, that let my kids get away with stuff that I couldn't get away with, it's different. So, you know, we evolve, we graduate, but I I think respect is both ways. I respect my kids because they're creations of the Lord, they're here and they're people and I feel they respect me. And just like if they come at me wrong, if a person on the street comes at me wrong and I'll correct them, I'll correct my kid too in that. So if you talk to me a certain way, I'm like, don't talk to me like that. Don't talk to anybody like that unless the situation warrants it. But that's how I would communicate with a stranger. That's how I'm going to communicate with you too. So I think it's a lot of it just comes down to respect. Now, I don't know if serial killers were raised like this and people can come back and be like, well, that's why they're going to pull up this episode and be like, well, that's why our kids are serial killers. Their kids are not going to be serial killers. But, you know, you just you never know that that's the thing with raising kids. It's a gamble. And I don't know where the success is measured for raising kids at what age, at what point, because you can have a kid be a bum till they're 30 and hit 31. And then that's what does it. So. It's an investment that you never really know. Well, seeing as how I don't know my parents, not the mom, you can blame Jessica for no longer getting your coffees when we come down to visit. Because I don't owe you nothing. Nothing. That's her fault. I mean, not technically mine. you do because you're usually asking her to watch your kids when she no, asks you for a coffee. No, I'm not. No, they want their babies. I want to see the pumpkin and, and pudding and whatever Sonoma's nickname is. She doesn't have a nickname. I thought it should be pie or plum. It should be Plum. menace. This is exactly what she is. She's a little menace on two brand new feet. <laughs> the way she be shuffling around she here. Is she's a little, she's a little shuffle. Um, so yeah. 
So we take two weeks off. You get a whole two hour episode. Yeah, you got an hour for each week. Brush vibes, which is going to be pain to edit. Good Lord. But, you know. You got it. We press on. Um, Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. Subscribe. If you're not subscribed, share with a friend. Give us your feedback on your thoughts. I thought this was going to be a lighter episode, but you know, we hit you, we hit, we hit some, some heavy topics. So give us your feedback, share your opinions. We'll try to get back at you, but we thank you and appreciate you for listening. We appreciate every member of the vibe tribe. Take care. Peace. We out. Couldn't have said it better myself. Peace. Yeah. Nothing but some grow pains. Yeah. Hey. Hey, I done came way too far, can't stop me now. I done came way too far, can't stop me now. I done came way too far, can't stop me now. I done came way too far, can't stop me now. Stop me now. Stop me now. Yeah, I done.